Yes, I remembered by for lots of things, you know, not making you a lot of money, but just for the things I used to do in India. Is that right? That's what you remember me for. <laughs> um, it's not. I'll tell you later. Uh, anyway, mate, uh, is that a real bookcase behind us? It is, my man. It is. Um, I haven't read them all, but I've read a lot of them. So, I'm not much of a reader. I disciplined myself to read maybe three or four hundred of these bloody things. But um, I tell you what, audio programs probably approaching. I'm, I'm not quite there. I'm approaching that magic Malcolm Gladwell ten thousand hours of listening to people like Mal, and many, many thousands of those ten thousand hours almost would be Mal Emmerich. So, um, yeah. so here's how sick I. Am. If I could avoid a twenty dollar book read by buying a $3,000 home study course that was sort of an audio program, I'd pay the three grand just to avoid reading a freaking $20 book. It was sick. Yeah, was well, sick. yeah, you're not, you're not that... I've done all right. You're not that dissimilar to myself because we know I'm, I'm a crap reader and uh, so I, I live with the, the, uh, with the audios. Uh, and the and the videos and ride my bike. It's audible now. I mean, audible yeah. now. You can get the twenty dollar book and have the author read it to you. Yeah, awesome. yeah, it's pretty pretty neat, isn't it, mate? So, firstly, uh, you know, the, the bookshelf is impressive, mate. Um, you know, we, we know that um, some wise man. I'm sure it was Jim Rowan or or uh, Zig Ziglar or someone like that, maybe even Kennedy, said, you know, you can tell, you know, the size of a guy's wealth by uh, the number of books he reads and the number of books in his library uh, because, you know, broke guys um, have got big TVs. Um, So, uh, you know, credit to you, mate. That's fantastic. And I can vouch for you firsthand because I know when you arrived um, way back, whenever that was, uh, large... Eight-ish. He's dumb and, dumb and broke to, to some extent. Uh, but, you know, you, you again, immersed yourself. Can you talk to the issue of immersion? You, you, you had the privilege of being in my environment, uh, not in the inception, but certainly early in the piece. You know... Well, I uh, you figured out, you lined out most of the bugs. I think I came in at the ideal time that... It was early enough that no one else in my marketplace had even thought of it, and arguably it still is. And but it was late enough that I wasn't one of your earliest guinea pigs. I mean, I feel <laughs> honoured that it was probably, at least for me, it was the perfect time. Yeah. Well, um, again, the issue of perfect time is about you, um, not about me. Uh, I, I suspect. Um, well, I like to think I know more now than I did then anyway, so I would argue price of disconnect anyway, uh, but I'm not doing the big stuff anymore. But you, you got to turn up in environments where you saw people having million dollar weekends, in some cases multi-million dollar weekends, and they turned up in my environment without a clue. Um, as you know, as you know, I, I got the privilege of teaching all this, and uh, the, oh, the concept of a million dollar weekend may be outside of your the ability to consume, but this actually goes on. Uh, And then there's everything in between, uh, which is outrageous businesses in your own categories and niches and domination, top 5% of your category or whatever it might be. And you got to see all of that going on, Glenn. Um, And you personally were one of the most immersed of all. Um, There was a time when I turned to you on stage when I forgot what I was going to say next. And Glenn would remind me of what I was going to say next. He knew me that well. And sometimes he'd ring me uh, in all sorts of weird times and, and, th- and doing weird stuff. And he'd, I'd hear me in the background and that sort of thing. So the immersion was big. But give us, give us, take us inside. Can you help us with um, the meaning of life? This is a big one. That's a little question. Okay. See, well, the meaning of life. To the subject of immersion, let me, let, let's go into that for a moment. Um, Jace, have you guys got a camera there, or am I? Or are we one way? I'm on the screen. But You're on the uh, screen. Yeah. Do you want to see him? We just didn't want to use up all the, all the fruit. Um, oh, there'll be plenty of bandwidth, I'm sure. Well, we're not so let sure. Me, let me have a look. You can still keep okay. me on. Okay. Uh, Jace, can you accommodate? That way I can see you too, so I can see who I'm hanging with. Okay. Uh, I'm the best looking. I'm just going to do my hair and make. Oh, I'm the best looking, Glenn, by a long way. <laughs> Does anyone there know me? Um, well, Mark Lewis is normally here. Oh, 
Uh, but, but he's not there? He's on holidays. Um, well, he's doing okay. We've got his brother, uh, Paul. Oh, really? No, who, okay. no, I'm um, a fan of your brother. We, we shared many of that. Uh, we, we shared many of average. Uh, <laughs> of course. He's still doing the sales thing, but uh, I remember once he said to me, I can't go to mail stuff anymore. I'm too busy making too much money. Well, that's, <laughs> that's one of the prices you pay. I, I, I've, 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 I've always said I create work. Yeah. You know, I didn't apologise for that. Um, I, remember, um, I remember a quote, I don't know if you guys have been hit with it, but I was given a quote once in 2008-ish, and it said, um, are you ready to work, rah, rah, uh, sleep next month? And it's now some 12 years later, I'm still waiting to get a frickin' nap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the one thing I've, I've said. Like, yeah, they were complaining, and I said, sleep next month. Yeah, I'm you know, you tell someone that cares, yeah, so let's, let's princess. To, uh, to, to what we're going to ramble on about. We're with immersion. This bookshop wasn't this big, and you know, you're only getting a little snapshot of it. So it starts there, it ends there, and it's and down the bottom, and this is only a partial amount of all of the, the, um, the bigger courses that just don't fit in a, in, in a bookshop. And it wasn't this when I got it, when I, when I started with that. But one of the principles that's come out of life while learning. Not only is there thousands of hours of Mal's content execution, the principles and the implementation of what to do and all of that, but when Mal, either, well, none of the skill sets that I learned from other mentors Mal didn't have, but from time to time, Mal would offer us other mentors to supplement Mal uh, in various specialty courses. So Mal would send us to various copywriting experts for if you wanted to go deep on the use of masterful language and compelling words, we would go and study uh, that particular subject with one of Mal's students who went and specialised in that. Or it might be specialising in any certain given media, be it nowadays, be it Facebook, Instagram and online. Back then it might be specialists in lumpy mail who would, who would sell you, um, you know, uh, it might be, I'm just looking around, I don't have any on me, but they might sell you bulk little things of nail polish here and Mal's copywriter would teach you how to write a sales letter with a headline, does your X, Y and Z need a polisher? And by putting this little piece of nail polish in your um, in your envelope, it would cripple your open rate. So Mal would bring us all of these sorts of experts into his world. And what that resulted in was very few people would do what I did, which is go to every, what was called Platinum Plus in my first minute, and it rebranded to business school thereafter, and now whatever inner circle you guys are in, it was an environment like you were in, that I joined for $12,000. I mean, there was hundreds of people there, not a dozen. If you wanted to join a, a dozen-odd person mentorship program like you're in right now, that was sort of starting at thirty to 35000 So I started with Mel's $12,000 thing, where we would quarterly get together in a, probably in a session like you're in now, that would go for two or three days, and I would fly around the country and go to all of those, in between the three months, I would study my ass off with whatever I was up to, and or I would go to one of the people Mal might have introduced me to, and I would go to their seminar, be it, um, you know, be it speaking, Mal introduced me to a bloke who taught me how to be a speaker, and another bloke who uh, taught me, in concert with Mal, how to run seminars of my own and be a producer. Like, really, I did a course of Mal, it was $50,000 for the year, it was basically, you become Matt. And I took that stuff and I went and applied it in my world and in my world, which is, you know, helping real estate agents do what they do better, I became Matt. Matt was true to his word. It wasn't one of these seminars where they say, oh, and I'm going to transfer everything I've got to you. Just give me 1995 for your ebook, and you've got everything I've got. Well, admittedly, it was $50,000, but Mal was true to his word. He gave me everything he had. I went and applied it and I became the Mal of my industry, you know, so, um, it, but that's the, I suppose, you know, we can, we can look at the, the result of that God, and I'll share with you a few of the fun things I've got to do as a result of that in a minute, but going back to the immersion, you know, Mal made a quote once, everyone wants to go to heaven, but no one wants to read the Bible. And I cover to cover. That is absolutely true, that everyone would love to have gotten the results that I got, 
but so few as a percentage, it might be 5% of Mal's environment, would have gone through the pain for the years upon years upon years of list, and I didn't want to do one second of the sitting my ass in a seminar like you're doing right now. I didn't want to do one second of listening to an audio program for 40 hours instead of listening, because I used to be a musician. I used to sing and play guitar and shit for a living. So I used to be a muser. I didn't want to listen to Mal Emery. God love him, and I love him now, and I owe him every cent that I've earned. wouldn't be in my bank account if it wasn't for Mal Emery. But I didn't want to listen to a second of any of those 10,000 hours. And think about it. You guys can do six, seven hours of content back. Try and imagine what 10,000 hours of doing what you're doing right now is like. So everyone wants to work out at Gold's Gym with Arnold Schwarzenegger and have the front cover of their book be that, right? Be me and Schwarzenegger at Gold's and, and you know, that's, that's my book. Everyone wants that. No one wants the pain of immersing myself in those, you know, the, the, the skills aren't insanely difficult. They just take some frickin' work to get them into our our soul, get them get them into our unconscious competence, so to speak. Now, maybe it'll only take you a thousand hours, but believe me, if you're going to do six, seven, eight hours of content today, even a thousand hours will be like torture. But I tell you, you, you don't get to go to heaven unless you read the frickin' Bible. So there's going to be some pain to get what you want. I would suggest. But uh, there's the start. Is if you're weak of heart and you Real, like I'm wearing a shirt by accident. How bad do you want it, right? If you don't want it real, real bad, that you're not willing to go through some pain, just get out now and go get go and ask Mal if you can work for him for 50 grand a year, because that'll be easier than the pain that this journey of scholarship is going to take you through. Depending on where you're at, and I don't, Mal, you might you might have introduced me to your highest of high end students, and they're all sitting there going. We know, Glenn, shut up and just get on with it. I don't know. But if you're newer to Mal's world, there's pain ahead. But I'd never earned more than, you know, 50 grand a year before I found this business, you know. Um, so, you know, Mal found me when I was a little bit above that. I'd just become a real estate agent and I was doing okay at that. But um, prior to, just before meeting Mal, I'd never earned more than 50 grand a year. Um, I grew up in Ipswich, for any of you guys who know Ipswich in Queensland, it ain't, the, it ain't the, the, the breeding grounds of billionaires like City Beach might be over there in Perth, it's where the, the, the roughest guts the kids grow up, you know, you can still hear the bogan twang in my voice. Um, you know, that, that was me and the pain of going through this learning curve and maybe I was the dumbest in Mal's room, that it took me 10,000 hours to do what should have taken me 500, but when I go to the bank no one asks me how long it took to get the skills to be worth uh, yeah. Great you know, comment. 40 grand a month on average that we bank. Um, you know, we do about 2.4 million last financial year. Um, so no one asked me at the bank um, how stupid I am that it took me to, to get the degree, so to speak. Uh, they just bank it, so. Yeah. The, 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 the overview, I suppose. Get out while you can, lot, you lot run. I'll give you a job. <laughs> Mate, um, t tell me, tell us some of your stories, you know, uh, hanging out with the Arnold Schwarzeneggers of this world. Well, what's all that well, like? That's it's the, the result. Um, did, did I share the screen there? Did that work? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, cool. So that's, um, I just threw this together before, um, before I, I threw on here. Some of you guys may or may not know this fellow, this is Eric Thomas, but he asked me this question in the middle of my mentorship. What would your goals be if you couldn't fail? And another one of my mentors asked me, what would your goals be if you weren't afraid? And to me, the answer to the, both those questions was one and the same thing. It was at my event called Be Phenomenal, that up until that point, I'd had speakers like Mal and like Pat Mercedi and many of my students had spoken at that event. But when I was asked that question, what would your biggest, grandest, fattest, dreamest goal be if you weren't afraid or if you couldn't fail? And that caveat was important for my goal setting putting it out there, is I wrote, have that fellow headline at one of my events. That's my childhood hero. Um, I you know, carried his posters around my entire life. I've still got them now, only now they're autographed with, you know, Love You Glenn or whatever. But I had no right to have that as a goal. Only with the safety of the caveat, if you couldn't fail, was I brave enough to put that goal out there. Because no one hires, like up until the time I did this in 2013, um, people didn't hire A-list Hollywood celebrities 
to have them come and speak at little real estate seminars. And it was Mal's teachings that I knew this was like the, 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 the I suppose, the, the Super Bowl, but I thought there's no way I could do that. Prior to this, I'd had John McGrath, you know, who's an Australian celebrity in real estate, uh, but I thought that was a coup when I made that happen. So I put that goal out there and, um, you know, the scariest thing happened, right? Because I was already a mentor. I was teaching some people. I was having little seminars, you know, with maybe the sort of numbers that you guys have got in that room now. Um, you know, I might have 12 people in there, that, that 50 people in there. I think the first seminar I begged Mal to come along to, I, I begged to get 50 people into that room just so Mal wouldn't be mad at me when I, when, when I introduced him. Um, and, uh, and, and so I was mentoring people. And when I put that goal out there, I made the mistake of showing that slide to my students and I said to them, when we were talking about goal setting, this is one of my goals. Don't know when I'll make it happen, who knows, but one day, who knows, right? And then I realized when I got home that night, oh shit, now I'm in trouble because what if they ask me how my goal's going two years from now? I don't want to go, oh yeah, haven't, uh, haven't done anything on that one. Because if I'm a mentor teaching other people about being successful, what's it say about me if I'm teaching them to be successful and go after their biggest goals, but I'm not doing the same. So what happened was I went to get a quote, and now I'll talk about this in the quietest of quiet rooms with the cone of silence on with your students. I went to find Arnold Schwarzenegger solely to get a number of how much it would cost to have him come and work with us just so I would have an excuse that when he told me or his people told me, oh, it's $3 million or whatever bloody hell cost I thought it might have been, and I had no idea what that sort of thing would cost, I, because I knew he got paid $15 odd million for Terminator 2, and I thought, oh, well, he's going to be millions, because I heard that Donald Trump's speaking fee when he spoke in 2011 or something in Australia was $2 million, so I thought if Trump was $2 million, Schwarzenegger is way more famous than Trump, so Trump and uh, Arnold must be at least three million. So, and here's what I actually want: I wanted a quote from Arnold, so that when one of my students asked me, "How's that Schwarzenegger goal that you told us about a couple of years ago going?" that I could say, "Well, you understand, Bob. Um, it's uh, three million dollars to hire him, and the numbers just don't add up. I'd have to charge you five thousand dollars a seminar, and that's why you don't see people like Arnold." Blah blah blah. All I wanted was my excuse, and the scariest thing in the world happened. The number came back, and it was, well, the, the event that I did last year with Arnold was, um, the total was $850,000, right? So Arnold's component of that is about half, uh, half of that, you know, thereabouts, a little bit under, but it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, but if you add on all the other expenses of marketing and the venue and all of that stuff, nearly a million bucks. And I couldn't afford to say yes to that number. But here's the thing, the number wasn't high enough that I didn't have my excuse either. Here I was coaching agents to be doing millions of dollars. And admittedly, I was doing good revenue at the time, I just wasn't liquid enough to say yes to that offer. It was too much to say yes to. But it was too little to give my excuse, so I was in a rock and a hard place and I had to say yes. So that was the biggest and scariest moment of my life, is I had to say yes, and I had no idea how to make it happen. But we ended up doing it, and you know, mm -hmm. the, the rest is history. You know, at that table right there, he invited me to go to his house, that's backstage in Brisbane. He, um, that's of course my son, Arnold, his partner Heather, the Altman brothers from Million Dollar Listing, my partner Naomi, and Arnold's PA. And we're sitting around chatting about stuff, and um, you know, Arnold's chatting to my son for 10 minutes about just shit, and, that was a dream come true. I was sitting there with a tear in my eye, but Arnold asked me to go to his house to play poker. So that's Arnold's backyard. Uh, been there the last four or five years in a row now. Um, that's Tim Ferriss, who wrote Four Hour Work Week, of course, and Four Hour Body, and best podcast in the world, or one of them. Um, me, Arnold, and 50 of his mates, and um, you know, ha hanging out. Don Cheadle, David Blaine. Um, you know, that, that's Arnold and his two sons. Um, that's uh, that, that's his real son Patrick there, and his fake son, Glenn. <laughs> um, uh, and that's us at Gold's Gym. I was going to do an interview with Arnold. And he said, no, you're going to lose a few pounds, dickhead. Let's lose the dumb pounds. We'll work out first. So um, that's us doing it at Gold's Gym. And, um, so no, so we've had, you know, it's been a great freaking journey, you know. Yeah. Um, and so when I set that goal, 
I, I love this quote, and I don't know who I'm quoting, because I can't remember who quoted it, but I remember someone said, set a goal so big you can't achieve it until you grow into the person who can. Yeah. And that's a goal that I've been brainwashing my mind for since I was a teenager. And bugger me, once I had some skills that Mal Emery taught me in my belt, um, I managed to you know tick that goal off, and I got a taste for it then. So whether it's being on Kevin Smith's podcast, whom I'm a massive fan of, uh, whether it's drinking with Stallone, whether it's um, you know having Stallone hit on my missus and him, her coming home with me still, which was all look at that look in Rambo's eyes. Um, so you know whether it's being hanging out, you know, uh, like Richard Branson last year invited us to get his, get our ass out to Necker to hang out with with Richard because we did some work together. Um, but then a freaking uh, a hurricane leveled his island. So yeah. We have to put that off for a little bit. But, um, you know, in, in the studio of Gary Vaynerchuk, in, you know, you guys will recognize that office. That's Gary's office in VaynerMedia in New York City. You know, I've got to live the life of my dreams as a result of implementing the things that Mal uh, kind of told me to implement. And, you know, I just made a big list of everyone that I would dream about working with once I got a taste for it, be it. Arnold Schwarzenegger, my childhood hero. Gary Vaynerchuk, my marketing hero, rather than Mal. Mal's the one. He Mal calls himself a famous person that no one's heard about except those who are important. So Mal's the guy who brought me to this world. And Gary's my American famous marketing hero. So I just have this big list and I'm just ticking them off. Because there's nothing that you... Now, I want to get... When that dude comes back, I'm going to say... That's the most important thing. I want you guys all to nod at knowing me, okay? When they do that. <laughs> with me on that? All right, good. All right, so, so I just started ticking off working with my heroes, and I'm honored to say that not, not one part of this journey, and I'm still warming up. I still think of myself as a rookie. Um, but I tell you, I've ticked off. You know, anything I do from here on in, having worked professionally, socially, hanging out, been in business with on multiple, multiple occasions now, twice in Australia, a couple of times in the States, with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Stallone. Those were my two heroes as a teenager. So everything from here is down. Because, you know, you know that thing, the one person on the planet you'd like to have dinner with? Well, for me, my entire life, that was Arnold Schwarzenegger. And now, you know, he's on this phone on, you know, I could text him. That's freaking insane. I still, I'm still pinching myself, but I, you know, it's, it's as a direct result of the stuff you're. Now, that's the good news, right? Whoever you want to hang out with and meet and socialize, be a business with, or whatever you want to do, you can do with the skills that you're getting there today. That's the good news. And the bad news is 10,000 freaking hours, right? Of learning, and, and then that's, that's just of learning. But then do it. So that last 30 seconds, I would suggest, is probably a million dollars in your pocket. Do you guys agree? Oh, that's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. 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 That's good. That's good. Right. So, um, yeah, anyway, Mal, how, does that kind of make some sense? Oh, that poor bugger just came back in. He missed the 30 seconds. Yeah, he did. <laughs> he, did. He, he did. The key of all keys. Well, <laughs> you know, mate, uh, well, weak bladders, weak minds, you know. Uh, <laughs> Mate, um, you can give the, the lady beside you a thousand bucks. Um, he could afford it today. Um, mate, um, I, I want to open it up to the room to see if they've got uh, something I'd like to ask you, mate. I promised that uh, they could literally ask you anything uh, and you'd, you'd answer it for them. So, guys, anyone got a question for or an observation for Glenn? Where is Glenn? Uh, where are you now, Glenn? Uh, now, I was in Perth a moment ago, and Mal texted me at five this morning, of course, knowing I'd be up. And um, he, uh, was it five my time or five yours? Uh, my time. Five your time, so seven mine. Um, yeah, so uh, saying, can I be there in person? Which I absolutely would have been there in person if I hadn't have left Perth two days, from Perth two days ago. So I'm in North Lakes at the moment, in South Africa. Right, okay. Any other questions for Glenn? Well, if they're not chomping out of the bit, Mal, let me give them the stuff you've probably already given them. Let me just go through this braggy shit. Oh, that's their, that's my client buying me a Harley, if there was any doubt that this stuff works. There's my tip. Mal gets watches and shit bought by his clients. Um, I get Harley Davidson, so that's pretty nice of them. Um, there's the, the lesson from Zeke. Help enough people get what they want, you get what you want. So one of the things that Mal will be teaching you, if you've gone to him to learn how to be a better dentist or a better, you know, fish and chip shop owner, like 
Um, if you guys were over in Perth, you'd know Sweet Lips over there. I went mate there the other day. They were a student of Mal's up against the Kalis brothers, and Mal taught them how to not only compete but win. Um, he'll teach you to go from being a great fish and chip shop owner, for example, to the coach of the fast food industry, you know, so that you can help other people get the same result you're doing. So after you fix your business and get it rocking, Mal may just help you become the coach to help other people in your industry do what they want to do. And certainly they may just buy you home Davis. And uh, I took one of my students with me to Arnold's house and that's him there, Jared, knocking out Don Cheadle. Yes, the great actor, um, Don Cheadle, uh, knocked him out. Jared came fourth in the poker competition, won himself a $30,000 watch. And Don Cheadle was not too happy that he came fifth because Don's competitive. So, so, um, so it was a lot of fun. But um, uh, so let me just get to the principles. I'm just going through. Oh, that, that, he was there last year. Um, where's my man? Oh, 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 I'm sure that's my student with Jason Statham. But, oh, there's us with Statham. Yeah. There's me, Arnold, and Sly. Pretty cool. All right, enough brag. Enough brag. All right, for any UFC fans there, that's me wrestling with George St. Pierre, the finest mixed martial artist on the planet. UFC undefeated. No, he's been beaten twice, I think. Uh, but considered by many the greatest of all time in the UFC, that's me wrestling with him six months ago. Um, but. Let's go to some principles. Oh, there you go, Mal. I'm still stealing your shit, mate. The truth will set you free, and the first will piss you off. <laughs> um, here's some big rocks. Let's go with them real, real quick. So first off, and Mal, stolen slide. I just improved the graphic. One <laughs> you start as a generalist in business, and that's hard. You might be a general practitioner, doctor, efficient chip shop owner, etc. You then get to be a specialist, and you get paid more money. You then are aiming to be the famous person in your particular niche, be it John McGrath in the real estate industry, Dr. Phil in the uh, medical industry, be it Arnold in the personal training industry, or Michelle Bridges. Be, you know, so you know, you'd name me a industry, and you can be the famous one in that. If you don't believe me, just you know, the, there's a celebrity vet, and I don't know what his name is. Does any the ladies know? Because he's good looking. What's his name? The vet guy on TV. Yeah. <laughs> Chris Brown. See, one of, one of the ladies knew that. Yeah. yeah. Good looking song again. Um, you can be a famous anything. There's a dude who wrote a book called, and I might get the title wrong, Don't Tell Mum I Work on the Oil Rigs. She Thinks I'm the Piano Player in a Whorehouse. Great title. <laughs> by the way. And if he can write a book and become a famous oil rig contractor, then you can become a famous version of whatever it is that you do. And I bet you bottom dollar that a, a vasectomy from uh, Bob Brown, the frickin' vet that's on TV, is more expensive than a local vet who's a generalist, who you don't know. So you want to become the top of this pyramid um, where you become the celebrity authority specialist and with all of the tools that Mal is going to help you craft so that you don't have to have, um, you know, because you think about the tools of, of what they are. Well, one of the first tools is you get photos taken with other famous people, right? So you start to become the celebrity specialist when you guys might not know me from Bar of Soap, but now that you see me screwing around with Branson, Vaynerchuk, Tim Ferriss, Stallone, Schwarzenegger, and, and the list goes on. And that's a minor, that's that's a partial list. If I look at my, my desk, my screen saver here, this is, almost the complete list. It's another way. And this, by the way, is another principle. I'm always trying to, um, what's the word, brainwash myself that this is who I get to hang out with. Right? These are the people. And I've got a version of this. What is Mal? I've got a version of this with you there, Mal. Thanks, buddy. Nice uh, to know. So no, I do. I've got a couple of versions of this that I rotate through. <laughs> this is my celebrities one. I've got one with just, just mentors. Right? And Mal is freaking right there in my mentors one. So, um, but I'm always brainwashing myself to, um, to you know, remind myself of, uh, of these things. But, you know, so that's one of the things that celebrities have in common. So what you want to do is you want to, with Mal's help, reverse engineer what makes famous people famous, right? And so one of them, of course, is writing a book on your area of expertise. Um, you know, and there's a bunch of other things that Mal will coach you through. But 
becoming the famous version of what it is that you do, no matter what it is that you do, whether it's writing your book, being interviewed in the media, getting better photos than your typical photos that you might get, um, you know, getting good video deployed on the various platforms, doing anything that a celebrity does, you want to do as well, because there's nothing that they do that you can't fake. When I say fake, I'm saying, you know, like, was this book published by Penguin? No. Is it good? Yeah. Good enough. You know, is the font a bit big so that I didn't have to write very much? Yeah. Um, there's still some photos in the middle. It still looks every bit like a book, and it is my story. But it didn't take me long to write, and no one, and you know, now it looks every bit like a published author. The ISBNs cost me 50 bucks or something, you know? Every, if you scan that ISBN, if you go to Amazon, you cannot tell nowadays the difference between self-published book and something published by Penguin. So there's, there's no impediment to you doing whatever it is that a famous person does other than your little bit of resourcefulness and you've got the right mentor in your corner in mouth. So, you know, you want to start by, by chipping away at those principles to make you the famous version of what it is you do. Then the other big rocks are marketing, you're in the right spot with Matt. Copywriting, you're in the right spot there. And going all in on social media, which is simply, um, when I say social media all in this, the reason that that's in there now is just because it's the media that every one of your market's eyeballs are glued on. And that is a changeable thing. When I first started in this game, uh, social media was a thing that was an optional extra that we might get to if we get time while we focused on emails, SMSs, and direct mail. Now I still do all those things, but it's all social media, and the other things are the optional added bonus extras that we get to if we get time. You know, so, but the, the, even though the media changes, be it at the moment it's Facebook, well, we're Facebook. You know what, it's a very cool thing nowadays, so I'm told, because I'm not cool, to remove your Facebook account and delete it from your phone. It's becoming the, the newest, funkiest thing. If you're at a party and you say, oh, I don't have a Facebook account, I deleted it from my phone. That's what the, the new, you know, hoity-toities do. Uh, you know, it's almost like an elitist thing, but I'm not on social media. So if that takes hold, well, wherever they go, us marketers are going to follow. So I say social media all in now only because the entire world, including all of us, including Mal, which he used to have this old brick of a thing that you couldn't do anything on except send text. Maybe he's still got the same thing. But we're all, it's maybe with Mal as the exception, we're all within arm's length of one of these devices um, that we barely use as a phone anymore. Like you think about it, when someone actually calls you, you're like, for God's sake, can't you send me a text, Mum? You know? Like, um, your own mother calls you, who you love, and you don't want to talk to her. So that's the only reason social media is on that all-in list. And the minute the consumers aren't there that much anymore, I'll be gone and I'll be wherever they are. You know? So, yeah. But you're in the right room for marketing, copywriting, learning social media and the tech behind that, and getting to be the famous person of whatever it is you do. Position So that when, here's the thing. If you went to a personal training workout and you were a fan of The Biggest Loser, instead of some random PT, if Michelle Bridges came out and said, I'm going to be your trainer for the day, that feeling that a fan of The Biggest Loser would get, if Michelle Bridges came out as a personal trainer, that's what you want to instill in your audience, in your marketplace, whoever it is that you serve. So if your business is geographic in nature, then when you walk around your business geographically to walk from your business down to the local coffee shop to get a cup of coffee, if you're not stopped five times in the street, then you're not fam you're not doing your job correctly. Right? If your marketplace, if you're somehow in the middle of your marketplace, and ge geographical is an easy way to describe it, like my guys are all real estate agents. The best of my guys cannot leave their office and walk 100 metres down the road, and I've been with them when we've done it, without being stopped three or four times in the street by other people wanting to say hello. So if we can use these principles to get a real estate agent, one of the most despised vocations in the world, known, liked, and trusted, then if you own a fish and chip shop, you're gonna be freaking, you know, uh, what's his name, bloody? Sweet uh, Gordon Ramsay, oh, you're gonna be the famous fish and chip shop owner. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Before you know it, because these principles work anywhere. If they'll work with a real estate agent, I work with anyone.
So there's a quick lesson. Bit, bit of breath, Mal. Now you've got the enviable job of that. Yeah, thanks, mate. Uh, Colin. Can I, uh, Glenn? I don't know if you can hear. Can you hear, Colin? Nice, nice and loud, Colin. Okay. Um, could you map out our customer, your customer journey? So when your clients come into your program, what's your offer, your first offer? Where do they start, and where are you taking them in their dream offer? Yeah, good question, mate. I've here's where I self confess I've gotten lazy because I've achieved some level of notoriety and fame in my marketplace. And it's dangerous, you know. When I had a couple of wins uh, early on, um, when I had Mal as my full-time mentor, paying you know a small fortune, even though he helped me make that small fortune a large one, so I do not begrudge the small fortune. Um, uh, Mal would say, "Yeah, yeah, right. Have a beer, have a drink. Let's celebrate for about one second. Then he'd say, "Righto, you're the tallest midget. Now what?" <laughs> now, it's hard to have a self-esteem around Mr. Emery, I must say. Um, but he was wrong because in recent years, my answer to Colin's question would be insufficient. But I would just take the easy way by writing a multiple, multiple six-figure check, getting someone like an Arnold Schwarzenegger, George Chevrolet, Richard Branson, Gary Payne, Chuck, blah, 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 blah. And I would use that as bait to get my clients and my soon-to-be clients to get their butt into a seminar room, even if they think I'm a dickhead, which many of them did, <laughs> and then I had two or three days to wear them down into thinking, yeah, he may be a dickhead, but he knows a thing or two, and they may buy something then and there, or that may be just the thing that gets them from thinking, he's a dickhead, but I want to meet Gary V, to, oh, he's still, you know, he's, he's all right, but they don't buy anything. But I've taken them up from a two out of 10 to a six out of 10. And then over time, I wear them down so that three years from now, they become a thirty, fifty thousand dollars a year client. So my answer to you, Colin, nowadays is embarrassing. It is not going to be any longer. I'm about to, and you'll see what I've been doing. Um, let me just uh, share my screen again. What I've been doing um, of late is, uh, wait, I'll change the screen. I'll just show you even, you know, the, now this may look all neat. I've got a microphone, I've got a it all looks neat. The rest of this room is a right. Right? Freaking right up. Look over there. There's a whiteboard in amongst the signed Arnold Schwarzenegger shit, the signed Branson shit. I love it. But look at that. There's a sequence up there. Assets to create. There's a book. Then there's, I've got to create an asset, which is a sales letter for that book. I'm going to also create another asset, which is the audio book. In fact, I think I took a photo of that whiteboard. I don't know if I took it in the right time or not. We'll just see if we'll find time. But this is just one example of something that, like a crude, Mal would be looking at this going, you idiot, have I taught you nothing? But it's a crude version of what Mal would, would want, like a flow chart. So it might be a book. Now, when it's crossed off, that means I've done it. Right? So I've got the book and I've got the sales letter. So now I need to do an audio book, which is going to be maybe a one-click upsell or maybe a bonus. I haven't decided yet. Um, I need a website with that sales letter. So that's an asset that I've got to create. I need to create a video sales letter for an upsell, which will be the Million Dollar Agent Summit that I did last year. A two day, I might offer a physical thing for maybe a couple of hundred bucks and a digital version for 80 bucks or something. I might do the physical version for 300 and the digital for 80, just so the physical version gives its life for the digital upsell. All that will be doing is liquidating the cost of advertising to sell or give away. And I haven't decided whether I'm going to sell or give away my book yet, um, because it is a good book and it is a physical book. If it was an e-book, I definitely would probably give it away, maybe. But yeah, well, I probably will sell it just so I'm starting my sales funnel with buyers, not with free opt-ins. I reckon I might have just made up my mind then and then. I'll probably sell the book so I start with someone with a credit card, because Mal talked years ago, a buyer is a buyer is a buyer. Um, so if someone will pay me seven bucks for a book, they might pay me 200 for a course, and they might pay me, um, what have I got here? Have I got my big thing on here? Well, but yeah, the webinar sequence, which is gonna sell a big thing. Someone who gives me seven bucks as a buyer might be someone who'll give me three grand as a, whatever that leads to. But now this isn't necessarily the what to do, but this is how to think, right? This is how to think. You don't just think book. Because book is bullshit and does nothing except maybe positions you with your client. But if that book is a piece of fate, 
that leads to upsells here where you end up. See, what will end up at about here, after this upsell, say one in 10 of the book buyers buy the $80 thing, and one in 30 people buy the physical thing. Well, if we take the $8, so one in 10 of $80 is $8 that we could apply per buyer, per book, and say another $8 for the physical or whatever, well, what that means is I can spend $16 more to advertise to get this book buyer. So all this is about having a complex matrix created where profit probably doesn't start to upsell too, if not the webinar that sells them something big. But look at what I end up with after all that stuff. I end up with buyers at break even or profit. So the, the, the question of budgets then goes out the window. That's what Mal told me. I think I'm quoting Mal here when I said budgets are for losers. Yep. When you've got a series of assets that will turn $1 in into $4.50 out, what freaking idiot would say, well, I've met my $100 budget, I've made my $450, I think I'll turn off that ad. You know, that's ridiculous. You keep running that ad until it stops doing a dollar in $4.50. So, um, so Colin, the answer in recent years is I'm embarrassed to say the answer of what my bait is on the front end has been hundreds of thousands of dollars in hiring of famous people to come to my front end seminars. Um, and But historically, it was everything that I learned from Mal. It was a free gift of 12 of my uh, best CDs, of which Mal was one of them. Me and Mal shooting shit, talking, talking marketing and stuff. Um, and, and 10 other mentors that I would give away 12 hours worth of, of my, my and other people's expertise for free in order to bribe them into taking a two-month free trial of even more good stuff so that on month three, they might give me 27 bucks. And with that particular funnel, we might call it, or, or system, or series of assets, I had, and it still goes to this day, with five years of content um, that, that is uh, you know, in, in an automation sequence. Um, so it's still sitting there making money five years later, and I've probably still got, with no, I don't even smell that thing now. It's run by one of my team members, and I do no advertising for it. So I am almost running it out till they stop paying me. But it's still giving me about two grand a month-ish. Um, about 150 people at $27 a month, so maybe three grand a month-ish. So paying for the staff member that runs it still in its entirety, and it takes her about half a day, um, where it started with a giveaway. And um, the first profit was, you know, because when that cost me $15 to create that gift at the front end, it was... Um, it, it, and I, I think I charged the free gift was maybe I charged them 15 bucks shipping. So it, I was down on the front end, I was up on the first $27 payment. So as long as they made it, as long as one in three people made it to the first payment, which almost everyone did, some cancelled after the first 27, maybe one in 10, but it was still a very little profitable thing. And that's one of the things you're gonna learn from Mal is, well, really the big principle here is psychology and maths. In that case, when it was a free thing that I used to gift virtually and they pay for shipping, the maths was what did my profit for me. But similarly, I still think the same way as I'm creating these, what do I want to dangle out there as some bait that my consumers might like? And then what am I going to do with them once I've acquired that buyer at break even or better? So mm -hmm. I hope that's a not too long-winded a way to answer what you asked on. Yeah, um, any other question there? I've got some observations. Um, any other questions? That, yes, uh, Chris, this is Chris. Big, loud voice, Chris. Hi, Ben. Um, can you tell me, what was the biggest mindset shift that helped to propel you, you know, apart from immersing yourself and doing the hard work, what was the biggest aha moment that allowed you to just go from being that real estate agent to where you are now? Yeah, okay, so... That's probably a long, a long answer, so I'll give the short version, because I'm the biggest freak in that room, meaning I'm the guy who needed the mindset shift more than every one of you probably combined. So off air, Mal might be able to tell you what a freaking dickhead I was, how I'd, I'd turn up to meetings like that, whinging that, um, that no one, that it doesn't work in, in my market, and, and I even had some mentors come over from America saying, Glenn, you might be just and the quote they used was, you might be just fishing in a smelly pond. And there's some validity to that in that the pond that I choose to fish in, being that my students are real estate agents, 
are probably harder than any other niche to play in. But that's the good news, bad news is. See, the good news about that is, the bad news is it's frickin' tough to crack them. The bad, news, the, 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 the bad news is it's tough. So the good news is most who come into this business and try with equal or even sometimes far superior skill set to mine, they come in and they play in real estate for a limited time and they are unwilling to go through the pain that it takes to figure them out, right? So I was just dumb enough probably to stick it out because I couldn't be asked changing ponds because I was one of them. Right, I had an affinity with them. I was a real estate agent, so I knew their language. Um, so, uh, so I stuck it out. I for stupidity or whatever. And anyway, we ended up certainly making them work um, where most haven't. And so I'm left being really the only one who plays with Mal's skill set in my entire industry in this country. And really, there's not that many left in the states, Mal. I think Procter doesn't go as hard as he wants. Mm. So, um, so it's good news there that the smelly pond was good because no other bastard could handle the stench. Um, but, but really to answer your questions around the shift in aha moments in mindset, and what I would say is, I needed them more than most because I didn't come with a great mindset. I, I, I'm still fighting a forty thousand dollar mindset. So there's no one big aha moment, Chris. It's I, as you saw before, I surround myself. That there is a movie called Rudy. On that, there is a plaque up the top that sort of you can't really read that says, my whole life people have been telling me what I could do and what I couldn't do, and I've always listened to them, believed in what they said. I don't want to do that anymore. And it's signed by the guy that they made the movie about. I have two monitors, one of which has whatever goal I'm working on at the moment, or it has that. Like, so I'm either focused on what I'm heading towards or reminding myself that the impossible is possible. Um, I have right there, me and Richard Branson screwing around on stage with the tie that he cut um, at my event, you know. Um, I've got there Arnold Schwarzenegger, that there says to Glenn, Arnold Schwarzenegger, there's photos of me and Arnold screwing around with a bunch of the times we've hung out. And so when I'm wanting to be inspired, I, I show myself that. See that one beside it where it says, I ain't got time to bleed? That's Jesse Ventura, that's a quote out of a movie, Predator, and that's there when I'm sooking. When I'm having a sook and when this business and the stress of $2.4 million in revenue a year is starting to hurt, right? Because understand that when you're doing that amount of revenue, there's pain involved. Because you've got, you know, now that I'm sort of somewhere near maybe the top of the mountain, uh, well, maybe not the top. I still don't think I'm at the top. I still keep a hungry, I suck mindset. But when that I suck mindset starts to get negative and I start to get a bit down or affected by the stress, we just look up at Jesse, say, I haven't got time to bleed. That's possible. So whatever you're going through, it's possible. I, I remind myself that I would have, you know, punched myself in the face if I've got the business that I've sort of got back when I first started in Mal's rooms, having achieved everything that would just have been a pipe dream back then. If I'd met someone like me whinging about the shit that I sometimes find myself whinging about, when I was desperately wanting that, sitting there in Mal's rooms for the first year, I would have wanted to punch myself in the face, right? So I constantly am surrounding myself with visual cues. You know, up, up there in the back, there's an autographed Michael Jordan jersey and an autographed Muhammad Ali jersey, right? I'm reminding myself. And on the other side of that wall is a Harley Davidson that my clients bought for me. You know, there's there's all sorts of signed shit that I've filled my house with reminders. They're not there for um, uh, for ego, right? They are there to keep my ego that is naturally kind of sure. I might come across as a bit enthusiastic and maybe even a bit confident now, but do understand that you know. And I say this in very closed doors, and I wouldn't be saying this to my students because I can't be as vulnerable with them. Um, because they come to me for strength a lot of the time. So I share with them a, an edited version of this. But I don't think I'm worth $2.4 million a year. So I have to use these sorts of triggers to fool and brainwash myself that I can still do the behaviours that result in $2.4 million even though my mindset is still that of forty grand a year. But know that the pressure of forty grand a month when I'm... Uh, no, forty grand a week, sorry. forty grand a week is what it results in. You know, our tax return last year, 2.4 million. So it's 40 odd a week. 
Can you imagine if you've got a $40,000 a year mindset when you earn $40,000 a week? It fucks with you. So that's my solution to it fucking with me, is I surround myself with visual cues that it's all good. And does it always work? No. I still get stressed and um, it's still, you know, uh, you know, it still is work. It still is work. But that being said, I paid pretty well to do the work. Yeah. Mate, um, your equivalent of um, investing in the Arnold Schwarzeneggers of the world is the equivalent of me um, giving away trips to Hawaii, uh, the um, airline, uh, which was, you know, groundbreaking in its day. Uh, everyone that attended an event got a free ticket to Hawaii. Um, trust me, it wasn't hard to sell. Um, and I charged $2,495 to come to that event. Also on stage, there was a car. So um, someone won the car. Um, and back in those days, it was what was Mal going to do next when I was doing all this. Um, I didn't quite go to the extent of the Schwarzeneggers of the world. But, um, uh, but similar budgets, Mal. We just chose to do different shit. Yeah, that's what I mean. That was, those tickets were $300,000. And even the yeah, airlines... So, there you go, so much. Yeah, yeah. Even, even the airlines didn't think they were going to get paid. Uh, the interesting thing was that um, they got paid after the event. Uh, do you pay Arnold after the event or before the event? <laughs> That's why there's stress, Chris. And <laughs> Everyone, when you're doing these tricks and things, wants to get paid up front, and all the money comes after. So there's like an $800,000 buffer that somehow some dickhead who might have 70 grand in his bank account or something at any given time. Because, you know, none of us, or maybe Mal is, but, you know, I've never kept myself millions of dollars liquid. So when I get a bill for, you know, Eight hundred and fifty odd thousand dollars. I ain't got it. So it's an interesting <laughs> phenomena. So Mal, I didn't have that luxury, unfortunately. Uh, well, I just rigged it, mate. That's all, because um, I didn't want to pay up front. Probably couldn't. Didn't have the capacity to pay up front. Uh, well, when I tried to pay our friend here, um, where was that? There's the, that's the last time I was at his house. That was when Skinny Glenn hung out with him. He was very impressed. I tried to counter offer his people. And if you've ever been in a negotiation where you were laughed at by the other side, <laughs> they literally, like, it's by email. And if you could laugh at someone over an email, they did. <laughs> <laughs> mate, so uh, what's next for Glenn Twiddle, mate? Um, look, I've got a list, man. I've got a yeah, list. Yeah. Uh, my top three on my list, now that I've ticked off my top three, who were Branson, Schwarzenegger, Stallone, um, and my, you know, my marketing hero in Vaynerchuk and all of that. I've got a list of like 15. You know, I just, I nearly, 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 this December, and it was only timing. The offer, it was just too soon. I had about three weeks to put 2,000 people into a seminar and do numbers similar to Arnold. We nearly got John Bon Jovi, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know that I shouldn't have said yes with the old, you know, devil may care attitude that Glenn Twiddle used to have. Um, I nearly did, but I'm getting a bit sooky in my old age. So I, I'm, I was really actually quite conflicted that I thought Twiddle Circuit 2015 would have done that, you pussy. Because I only had three weeks, so I didn't think it could be done. Yeah. So, because um, I didn't know if John Mojave was as big or a bigger or not as big a star to bank a million dollars on. So I nearly did. But anyway, he's on my list. So I've got Oprah and John Bon Jovi and Dwayne Johnson and Will Smith, and I've just got this list of 15 heroes of mine that I would love to associate with, be in business with, and bring to my students. But um, so what's in the future is more of the same, but you know, more heroes of mine that I get to live the life of my dreams. But really, the biggest thing for me is stopping being lazy around Colin's question, getting these assets that I've got mapped out. Um, and I've got the skills to create. I've got the skills to do an enthusiastic video uh, sales letter upsell. I've got the skills to do all of those things. And if I don't have the skills, I've got the experts of copywriting. Even though I'm a half decent copywriter myself, I may or may not engage Steve Plummer, one of Mal's uh, personally hand-taught copywriters, who I just hired to come and speak at one of my seminars, like an event you're at with my high-end students. I gave Steve some money to come and teach them uh, the art of compelling words. So I've got the skills. What's next for me is not being an embarrassment to my mentors, that if Mal saw what I've created, 
Um, the result may be pretty impressive, but I am still nothing more than the tallest midget. I need to now start to deploy the assets that will give me some of the the ability to write a cheque for 500000 without it hurting. See, at the moment, I could have said yes to John Bon Jovi, but it would have been every penny I've got, a whole bunch of pennies that I wouldn't got, and it would have been three weeks of probably, you know, 10 years off my life ending stress. And I just didn't want to do it, knowing that I can turn this tap on whenever I want. Now, the opportunity was there in December because John was touring with Bon Jovi. That's why. So when they were touring, I could have got him at a slightly discounted rate. Um, but this guy rate is still ridiculous for us mere mortals who have a $40,000 mindset that these buggers earn in four hours what we earn in 10 years, you know? So, um, you know, so what's next, Mal, is just being a better marketer and not being such a hack because I've made a, a, a career out of being a jack of all trades but a master of none. So this year I'm, I'm, I'm going to get better at that so that I've got some more reliability and predictability of income. Because mm. at the moment, I'm still a, I suppose, a slave that if I don't run the seminars personally, my income will eventually dwindle. It'll mm. still be good. I'll never, I'll never need a job again in my life, given that a thing I made eight years ago is still paying me two grand a month, three grand a month, whatever it is. So oh. I'll never need money again. It's just whether I'm earning 2.4 or whether I'm earning 300 grand or whatever is the variable. So I'm mm. earning 2.4 with the stress commensurate with 200,000. That's what's next for me. So just the observation might be it's been too easy to just write the check out. Uh, and uh, you remember back in the day that I, I left nothing to chance when it came to the, uh, the marketing of the event and also the extraction of the money when I had them there. I had all sorts of psychology going on and, um, and all of that. And maybe uh, your own observation is you need to break it down to, to that level again and still write the check uh, at the same time. And, uh, and then you, you, you put that lot together and uh, who knows where that might take you, mate. Yeah, well, I spent so, a couple of days, and I don't know how advanced your guys are there, Mal, but if any of the advanced students in your room there will know the name Frank Kern. He's one of the better marketers on the planet, a student of Dan Kennedy's, as you and I are, Mal. Yep. Because um, Mal introduced me to one of his mentors, very selflessly, a uh, fellow by the name of Dan Kennedy. Um, and Frank Kern is like a Dan Kennedy kind of thing. And I spent two days in a room with me, 10 people, and by the way, uh, Mal, on one of Frank's programs, he says that you didn't drink enough of his red wine when you stayed at his house for two days. <laughs> <laughs> um, have, you tasted, have you tasted his red wine? <laughs> he did, did <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so Frank, I got to spend uh, you know, a couple of days with, and I asked him this question. I said, Frank, should I focus on my business of optimizing what I'm currently doing, being real estate niche, in Australian geography, should I expand the niche to be more of a generalist? Because the tools that I've applied would certainly work in any one of your businesses. As you know, I'm learning the same things that you're learning through mouth. So, should I be a general? Should I expand to be a generalist in Australia? Should I keep the niche and expand the geography to include the United States? So, stay a real estate coach but expand the geography to the states. So keep the niche, expand the geography. Keep the geography and expand the niche to be more general, or should I optimize what I'm doing, niche and country? And he said, hands down, you're leaving too much money on the table yeah. Yeah. to not do optimize what you're currently doing. So that is yeah. absolutely what uh, Naomi and I, and uh, you know, under Frank's tutelage, under um, Mal's tutelage, under what I already know, yeah. that's the path we're taking. Is Stop leaving the freaking money on the table. I used to not even sell my own real coaching other than to real estate agents and not terribly high end. I didn't even really pitch my own stuff. And Mal taught me probably seminar number one. The best thing about selling your own stuff is you get 100% of the money. money. See, when I've had Mal come to my events over the years, you know, Mal and I have now got a probably 10 year long business relationship where Mal will come and speak on my stage. Some, one of my students will buy some of his stuff and Mal and I will split <coughs> the money, right? But 
I'd, I'd, so I'd get people like Mal, and Mal was, you know, and still is one of the main... I, I only trust a very few mentors to that. There's probably five people that I just go to time and time and time again. Um, you know, and Mal was one of the ones that's in the 10-plus events that we've done together, if not more. Um, you know, that, that I didn't take advantage of the selling my own stuff there. So um, we've now got uh, my partner Naomi, again, under Mal's tutelage, uh, selling from stage, um, and we do some of it together, some of it just her, some of it just me, and it's, um, it's really a case of optimising what we're currently doing uh, and stop leaving those dollars sitting there lying around on the table. Well, you made a great uh, point there, Glenn, because back in that day, uh, when you remember my big events, I would do two million myself. Yep. So really, I, I didn't need to... Everything else was a bonus. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I could go out on the limb knowing that I could at, at least keep all that money for myself by being able to sell on my feet. And what so, I'm doing is I'm, I'm creating now... I've got one speaker in Australia and one in America that I've told I'll do this thing for for three grand. And they're just, they're just chipping my normal group coaching where they don't speak to me at all ever one-on-one. -on -one. And I said... What I'm going to do is I'm going to, because one's a little a young kid who's a person who wants to be a speaker, who already is a speaker and an author, and he wants to kind of take that to another level. So I said, I'll coach you, and I've got one here in Australia who's absolutely starting from scratch, like not known by anyone. And so I'm coaching them for virtually nothing, but I'm documenting my process along the way so that I can start in what Mal taught me to do in year number one probably, Instead of just becoming a real estate coach, which I am, I'll be able to have a documented process to help teach people what I've done, probably the best. See, I've been good at creating a marketing program for real estate agents that kicks ass, gets them famous or whatever, but the thing I've done best that I over-indexing is the helping of a no one with a $40,000 mindset, i.e. me, and making me famous within a niche and then putting bums on seats at the seminar. So one day that will be the thing that I do. It will be very high cost and it will be very selectly chosen because uh, I don't want to create too many competitors. But I'll teach competitors in other niches how to become the Glen of their world. And we won't start with hiring, you know, if you're a fish and chip shop owner, we won't start with hiring Gordon Ramsay. We'll start with levels. And if you're at level one, we'll go to level three and we'll beg Mal to come to a seminar that you put on for other fish and chip takeaway owners or something. You know what I mean? And we'll help create a seminar business and a personal branded celebrity position. You know, what I'll do is I'll start loaning out my team. I have a team of nine staff who work for me now, graphic designers, <coughs> onshore, offshore, in Australia, overseas, that create these assets that we talk about. So one day I'll offer them to other experts so that I can create coaches. Not so much the principles, because a lot of them already know the principles, but the thing that Mal identified in me very quick is him and one of his students at the time, Brett Thompson, called me the implementation king. Because I would actually leave the seminar and heaven forbid, I would go and do something. And it seems I was the rarity in Mal's environment which was confusing to me until I started coaching for myself. And I thought, oh, really? People do pay to come to seminars, and then they don't do stuff. I couldn't fathom why you would pay Mal the money. 12 grand a year was the, the program that I first entered. Why would you pay him $1,000 a month, 12 grand a year, and not do a darn thing? Because I went away the first seminar that I was there with Mal. Went away, and on the second seminar that I was there, told Mal before the seminar what I did, during the um, three months that we were gone. And he said, you've got to jump up on stage and uh, I'll give you 20 minutes and you can tell them what you did. And uh, we'll do that tomorrow. Prepare some slides tonight, will you? And I'm like, well, okay. And I sort of thought it was like Mal just taking pity on the new bloke, making me feel welcome. But then I was attacked with the lunch break. So, oh, really, how'd you do that? And what'd you do? Well, it turns out I was one of the only poor buggers in that room that actually went and did something with the information. So, yeah. guys, if you're in a room that small and you've got Mal, I hope, I'm assuming you're paying 50 grand or something a year to be there, um, avail yourself. Now, Close. if you're paying 50 grand a year, you'll probably go do something just to get your 50 grand back. Mm -hmm. But if you are in any, if you're there on a guest pass, and I don't know if Mal does that sort of thing or whatever, but if you're there not paying very much, pretend you're paying five grand a month, 60 grand a year for the privilege of sitting there, 
and run out of that room and do something with it because you will be in the minority of business owners if you do. Yeah, mate, I put you up there selfishly uh, because I wanted them to see what was possible. Uh, because the problem is we're our own worst enemy, where all this stuff is concerned. Uh, and you know yourself, the implementation, by doing stuff, that's how you find out what works. And by not doing it, well, of course, it never worked and it never would have worked. So that's where most of them stay. And I still can't tell the difference uh, looking at people. You know, it's still a mystery to me, uh, that meaning of life. If we, any of us worked that one out, we'll have done well. But, mate, I want to thank you for your time. We've had you for a full hour here. Um, I think you've been very gracious, um, as always you are. You're still the Glenn I met a long, long time ago, and I can't say that about all of the people I've helped. Um, some of them refuse to utter my name, uh, which is interesting. Uh, but the point is, mate, um, you're probably the most successful. I think it's time you acknowledge that. There's some pretty big players that have been involved in the environment you were in um, way back in the day, like we talk about. But, mate, congratulations. I mean, I think I'd, I'd have to say you've taken it to a level probably greater than any of them uh, when you think about it. You know what I mean? Who, who would have thought? I probably got the, I don't know, the, the live the life of your dreams shit maybe more than many. But a lot of them did smarter things with others. Yeah. They taught them on keeping some of that money. Yeah, I won't dispute that. Uh, but I don't you, keep a lot of it, mate. I tell you, no, I spend a, no. a lot of it doing yeah. the next thing. Yeah, you know, well... Um, this is money in my bank account, Mal, I think. Who can I give it to? That's the UFC fighter. You know, that's, yeah. as a kid, I was a wrestler. Yeah. And I thought, OK, who's the best of that? OK, it's George St. Pierre. And that was just to make some money in the bank account. I thought, right, let's do George St. Pierre. <laughs> so well, not the smartest point when it comes to keeping it, but I can certainly figure out a yeah. way up to earn it. Well, you know the model. Anyway, buddy, can we all just thank uh, Glenn, please, this time? <laughs> Cheers, mate. Thank you. See you. Jace, can you take care of business? See you, mate. Thank you. Ah, right, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, hearing it from Glenn's perspective, uh, arriving in the, the room as a complete newbie back in the day and um, the progress. He made a good observation. He, he made lots. Um, he doesn't hang on to anywhere near as many, much of the money that a lot of the others do. Uh, there's no doubt about it. It's because of his model. And uh, his model is dependent upon other people uh, to produce. Um, he, he, he is a seminar event organiser. Um, and you only get paid when they make money. Uh, and that's what I've always advocated to him. He has to be selling his own product. Uh, and if you look at the people that are, that are still doing very, very well and are capable of doing well in any particular niche they care to attack in this industry, which is the seminar industry, uh, and one might be LinkedIn specialist. I've got a girl making a fortune teaching LinkedIn. Um, she came with no intentions of LinkedIn, but came to the speaking events, learned how to speak, and then niched herself. Because it wasn't my job to niche her. And it was never my job to niche Glenn, but the natural byproduct of what he was doing um, was to help agents, which is often the case in the industry you're in, depending upon the numbers and the maths. It's all controlled by maths. Okay, there's sufficient uh, agents in this country and sufficient pain and difficulty uh, that you can um, you can make a, a good living from it. So uh, the most successful have morphed into information marketers. That said, we're all in the information marketing business, and it's information first is how you should be doing business today information first. So uh, let's get cracking. Uh, here's what we got to. I felt an, a necessity to wind the clock back a little bit and talk about the Triple B blueprint uh, consists of three billion dollar building blocks. Uh, you don't, you, these are the new slides we've run off for you today. Uh, you should have them there. Um, I've added a little to it here and there but we'll get to it. So he, here's what it's about. This is what I taught way back in the day. And this is the thing you must turn to every single time you're having a conversation, whether it be tactically, strategically, or even based on principle. This is a principle. In other words, it stands the test of time. In a thousand years from now, they'll still be using uh, the building blocks I'm referring to here. And what they are, and there is an order, market. 
Everything comes from market. Every conversation, everything we do uh, comes from a market. Then, of course, it's a, a message congruent with the market. And if you think about Glenn here, you know, the conversation would be agents. And then it might be around the, the conversation of uh, the, the problems a- agents face. Usually it's making sales. And, of course, finally, media um, or medium, depending upon the language you want to use. So um, it is the foundation of all business success, and it's fundamental to all business success. It doesn't matter if it's geographical or what it is, you still need the triangle. So I call it the 60-second triple B blueprint um, for a reason, because within 60 seconds, you can run it through this blueprint, whatever opportunity presents itself. So if we talk about the opportunity in the city right now, okay, Um, let's have a look. You've got a market already there walking around the city in sufficient numbers um, that you're paying nothing to get them there. The media is free for 12 months. Uh, So you know you're you've got an audience going past your door. Now, we've got fantastic messages. Oh, shivers, sorry, my apologies. We've got fantastic messages. So, you know, our message is going to be, you know, win a a $50,000 kitchen or bathroom makeover. We're not going to be trying to sell anything. And, of course, right there and then, we're going to have the shock and awes um, already done and dusted, and when someone signs up there and then and pull fills out their details, they're going to get this thing that does all the heavy lifting. Most of you are familiar with this now. But this is my most famous. I'm Owen Grant, and welcome to Dent. So when they say they want a, a, a kitchen makeover, and whoever is there would be um, would be uh, closing and, and finding out exactly who were the hot and heavies, um, you'd give them that maybe. Okay, not to everybody, but because that does all the heavy lifting, and then uh, that's the message. Okay, but it's not trying to sell you uh, anything. It's education and uh, f- reports are still one of the most popular things online. Free reports. That's why we keep writing them um, because people want education more than anything. So, uh, and then uh, we've got the media for free. So the market's walking around. Now, there's people there with kitchens, uh, with houses, <laughs> wanting solar systems, anything else you can think of, and cups of coffee, uh, and coffee beans to take home. See, my view there would be for 12 months you build your database. It, sure, we sell coffee and we sell coffee beans, but we run the competition in the city. Uh, we've just got a 1,000 j- join up from the markets signing up uh, from a competition which was never run before. A thousand people have joined um, that competition to win uh, a bag of coffee a month. A month. Okay, and it's growing fast. They're all database. We're now writing SMSs to them. Things, contacts that we never made before. Previously, someone just landed somewhere, bought a coffee somewhere, bought some coffee beans somewhere. We now have top of consciousness. But our greatest asset is the list. So if I had my way, if we do this, we, we build a herd of ten to 50,000 in 12 months in a media that cost us what? Zero. It's unheard of. But it's, again, um, it's being agnostic where media is concerned. If we had childcare all over the state, we'd be there. We'd be in the city. Okay? That's what we'd be doing. Unfortunately, we can't get them where we want them right now uh, in, the, in the timing and the speed with which we want to be doing it. We'd rather be building them a lot faster. All right? Uh, so, um, that's, so the triangle speaks to all of that conversation. So that's why I'm, I'm reading the paper. I go, you're kidding me. Really? <laughs> you can do that? Uh, I can see some spas in there. I don't know about you, but, you know, in a competition... Uh, to win a spa, the elite spa plat package of 
valued at $50,000, but uh, there is an order. So building block number one uh, is uh, building block number two, and it looks like that. So right message, right market. So um, me message is absolutely critical. Well, it starts with market. Confuse myself there for a moment. But market is absolutely first. You don't need me to remind you constantly here. But uh, I've also created a document um, in relation to your ideal avatar. And uh, in, in the coming months, uh, we're going to take the time to actually think about your ideal avatar or avatars and get really clear. And we can even think about in terms of your niche as well. I've got some documentations that I've created where I can take you through some exercises that you might find very valuable um, where all that's concerned. But market first, product and service is last. So we build our product la uh, last, and then we, but we base the creation of the product on the market, which is contrary to how everyone else does business. Most people go, oh, I'm going to open a restaurant, and here's what I'm going to do, and now I'm going to try and find some clients. No, we don't do it that way at all. We do it completely opposite. And of course, Gary Halbert, um, the famous copywriter, probably the best of all time, arguably, late, great, uh, said, you know, we're going to open a restaurant, you can have anything you want, what do you want? Uh, the answer is a starving crowd, well, that was his answer, a starving crowd. I would ask, I would add, with money. That's all I'd add. A starving crowd, with not, no good just having a starving crowd, they have to have money, because we're not a charity, last time I looked. So, um, yeah, yes. Asking what question? What do you want? In order to um, generate or build something, do you know what I mean? Like, um, whatever you're producing, take the um, daycare. Yes. For an example. Okay. You did that survey out to people. People are answering your question. Why should they answer your question and not someone that they like? They don't know you. I wrote an email yeah. and a letter, uh, and the letter said, "I want to build the best childcare in the world." Who are you to them? No, they didn't know me. No. They didn't know me. Okay. okay. But I said, "We own a block of land." And we want to build the best childcare known to man to help kids like yours. Would you help us, please? And 200 parents did. The survey was extensive. And it was carried out on the phone. You know, it wasn't done via email. It was done face to face. They were all people who already belonged to childcare. To a childcare, to a childcare business. So uh, they were my ideal parent, ideal avatar, because they were parents, and they experienced what they already knew what it was like to uh, be in a childcare. And for me to create the best possible childcare, who better to us than you, parents? And people, you know, related to that conversation. Um, I don't recall any parent. I didn't do the survey. I wrote the survey. Uh, with the help of um, some people that know more about kids than I do, um, and, and childcare, because it was a long time between drinks for me, and a lot had changed, uh, but it was information that was available to us. And uh, Duncan was in the room. Uh, when I turned to one of our partners, whose list I used, and I said, I want to survey your clients, and we had just got together as a partnership, he went white. Uh, well, he was worried about, and I saw, I said, mate, you're worried about what they're going to say about you. I'm not, I don't really care. This isn't about you. It's about knowing what we need to build so I can match the market and rig this game as best as I can humanly is possible. It's me doing what I'm suggesting you do. Um, and, and, and fortunately, it has a happy ending. <laughs> you know, they told us exactly what I needed to call it, uh, what it needed to deliver. It took some contemplation, but at least then I had the right information to, in order to develop what they wanted. Rather than me go off and build what I want to build, or I had very little say in the construction. I wasn't 
terribly interested because I was the wrong person. My job was to, to fill it up. Sure, so if you're asking the question to a targeted audience, yes. you're going to answer the question, as opposed to you're asking about childcare to someone that doesn't... Have, have children? No, no. We'd, need, we'd want to be talking to a, um, an audience that's interested. So this, this, what we did here... Uh, it said, uh, w- would you like to, to win $50,000 air conditioning, make, uh, you know, uh, kitchen, bathroom makeover? Uh, yes or no? Uh, when would, would, it, would you like to purchase or invest in one? Yes or no? You know, so we asked pertinent questions and some have said no, uh, not interested. But it still allowed us to sift and sort in the media and find out more about them. Now, now we can survey them. We can do what we like. You know, I'm wanting to put a survey out to Magda's folk to, to get the name of this coffee brand that we're looking for. I'd like to give them a choice for them to tell us which, ones they think is the right, which one they think is the right name. I think it would be helpful rather than me try and give my opinion uh, or, or and even open the door for them to come up with some suggestions. And that means telling them, because you'll be surprised what might come up, and that means telling them what we're trying to do and create and what name would you give it. So here's our suggestions, which one's your choice, and, and w- have you got a suggestion for us? And um, care, Yes. You would have said to them, what... Um, what environment do you want your children to yeah, be in? Um, yeah. What's what? most important to you as far as your yeah. child care is concerned? Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, the survey was long. Yeah. It was extensive. And so then you could put it together and go, the majority of people want um, you know, a, a, an elaborate playground and a beautiful kitchen. Organic and, you know, no plastics and, you know, so we're... And they wanted the right food, and they wanted meals they could choose, and so we've got a, we've got a full a full um, chef. And, you built that yeah. from what and they wanted you massages, did. and they wanted yoga, and you know. And so I, we got to create the very thing that they wanted from us. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, but most of all, they wanted their child to get a good head start in life in the informative years. So every piece of language, I didn't. Oh, I did bring a shock and all. So this has just been uh, redone again. Um, but every, every bit of this document speaks to that. Every piece of the shock and awe speaks to that very subject. Okay? Nothing's left to chance. The best thing you can do, I know Magda's been there, is go and watch the video on this site. The professional, it's in here as well, recorded video, which is a tour of the child care. It's called a dramatic demonstration. That's its marketing term. It's spectacular. What did it cost us, buddy? Six or eight grand or something, somewhere around there, including the hiring of the whatever. Did we offer the parents a gift for filling out the survey? We didn't, did we? I just appealed to their humility, didn't I? Their parental humility. I no, I don't recall one either. We often do, though. Um, yes, yeah, selectively. I would, uh, you know, because these are, ours are expensive. Uh, we're doing the pop-up this week, and uh, when, when they fill out the form, at the, uh, the uh, uh, entry, it asks them three or four questions. So our staff know which ones we want them to give those to, because ours include a USB stick, which is the tour of the centre as well. They're six or seven or eight bucks each. So our, our but it's the best thing we ever did, and we did it from day one, and this will be the best thing you two it's a, no one thing brings down the aeroplane, but if we have something that happens between uh, them meeting you or coming into your lead generation system and, and before you arrive uh, at their, for the sales process, uh, that's the best thing you can do. Okay? What happens before the sale, arguably more important. Okay? And this thing does all this magnificent heavy lifting. So when you get there, you know, they just sign up. That's the whole point, because they're getting nothing from anybody else. Nothing at all. Um, so, uh, have we answered your question? You need a ideal list. Uh, we're building it for free. We're building it for free. 
Magda didn't gather a list previously. We've now got a thousand people. That is representative. If we had a hundred, the stat won't change. Okay, whatever question we have. Have we done a survey yet? Have we asked them anything? No. Have we asked them how many questions, uh, how many coffee they're drinking a day? Yeah, well, that was in the, in the entry form. It's, um, do you prefer beans or, do you buy beans or ground? Um, in other words, grind your own. How many coffees do you have a day? Yeah. And would you like to join a um, coffee lovers club? And we're staggered. It's like, is it 80%? Yeah. Want to be part of the club? We haven't invented it yet. So now one of our jobs is to create the club. What a good problem to have. And you go back to me and say, you said you wanted a club. Here it is. And I'm using direct mail if she gives me half a chance because nothing will beat the letterbox. You see how Glenn's dropped the ball and it's been too easy to write out the check. And he admits it. You've got to admire his honesty in answering you, Colin. Okay? He said, I'm not doing enough. No, we're near it. Does the person who asked the best question get a free ticket to his two-day we, event? We, we, <laughs> sorry for... for... For asking the best question, get a free ticket You mean here? Wasn't that to do... With, was it the joke or the question? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to win something for the best... for the worst joke. Yeah. <laughs> okay? It's coming your way very shortly. <laughs> he thinks he's a comedian <laughs> over in the corner <laughs> over... <laughs> um, have we answered your question okay so um, there almost hasn't been a client recently where I could survey that I haven't and um, it's been surveyed for this guy for dentists totally changed what we said in here okay did we do a survey for you or didn't we have a list we didn't have a list did we yeah, okay. All right. It's rare for me not to, but I'm going to. Okay, now we've, we, we needed to get this working for you. That was where our energy had to go. Yeah. Well, we knew what they wanted. They wanted to be cool, didn't they? They want to be hot in summer. They want to be cool in, in uh, summer and uh, warm in winter, largely. Um, so, um, starving crowd. Okay, you just can't beat a starving crowd with money. Now, if I added anything, it would be in pain. And Glenn didn't allude to it, but he'd agree with me um, that the thing that seems to get people to move is level of pain. And mostly we're not in enough pain. And as a consequence, you know, it's too easy not to implement or not to do it. So... Um, um, rule number one, stop dealing with people who don't want, need, can't afford your product or service. So it's discrimination. We advocate discrimination because everything gets a whole lot easier. So these ads are very clear. You know, we're promoting a, a gift, a, a prize, a lottery, but that it leads to the thing we sell. Um, only talk to people who are already predisposed to buy your product or service. Okay, preferably, because there's an... That's where you go with your uh, timeline within the survey of the question. Mm. Are you ready to buy now, three months, six months, nine months? So mm. if you're not ready for three months, it's point to be talking constantly to them. Or nine months, you would a little bit, little bit, and then going towards the ninth month, you'd then yeah. lean on it. Well, we get to put them into what's called buckets. Okay, so this is the 12-month bucket. This is the... In the, the six-month bucket. This is the now bucket. So obviously there's tremendous urgency around the now. Why? Because they're going to land somewhere. And we want to influence where they land. Okay, so a bunch of things have to happen very quickly. Uh, part of which we're making up on the run. Okay, because the first thing is we had to get the leads in the place. But we've got all the emails, follow-up emails written, all that stuff ready to go out. There are also the direct mails written and so on and so forth as to whether these guys uh, actually implement it and use it. With our encouragement, they will. And they're all on an Infusionsoft type of thing um, to manage all this process because that's where your scaling comes from. Scaling comes from automation. Otherwise, you can't manage this damn thing. It's a monster. And they're going to need salespeople, uh, that's, which is great because one of the distinctions between a business that makes a you know five million 
10 million, 50 million net is it employs a commission sales team. Remember that slide? But in, in Stan's instance at the moment, he would not need to directly go to employing a salesperson. He would he would need first up. He would need somebody to just sort through the mail that's slightly educated to then transform them from a possibility to a, to a full on lead, and that's where the sales team. Would be. Yeah, well, the first thing that should have gone out is the shock and awe. We just haven't got it finished yet. Mm-hmm. But that, could, that doesn't need to be done by a salesperson. That, does it? That's, that's mailed out yeah. with that video card, and they are, when they say yes, I want one now, they should get the shock and awe. Okay, that's the first thing, and they're going to be shock and awed because they're not getting anything from anybody else. And this is professionally written. It is the sixty-four page sales letter broken up into eight parts, and on top of that, it's um, it's got a video card. Uh, which no one's definitely got, you know, which articulates why we, you should choose our company. as a, What's your guarantee, Stan, that's kicking butt for you uh, yeah, for a um, air conditioning unit? Ten, ten years uh, guarantee. Ten years, years replacement. replacement guarantee. Great word. Ten year replacement. Everyone in his industry thinks he's nuts. But we've done the numbers. But that doesn't mean he has to replace the whole unit. He has to replace the faulty part. Well, we won't get into the debate. Trust me, we've had the conversation and we know what our maths tell us and what we can afford to guarantee and not. All the problems happen in the first year or two, or two with these things. The industry does five years, is that right? Yeah, five years. Yeah, but virtually nothing. And they have to have the, um, the warranty program. Yeah. Uh, which we give them free for the first year. So we've now built continuity into this whole process where we're getting paid, selling it once, getting paid for life. Because it's transactional, which craps me off, but I can't change what this guy does. My job is to fix uh, it. All right? But if I can build um, back end into the conversation, I'm going to try to. Yeah. Um, Does that all make sense? Yep. Um, client avatar, and we'll spend some time on that. Uh, most people see everything, observe little, and gain no knowledge from any of it. That's um, a, a quote from Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Whereas we're really interested in them and what they have to say and what they're thinking. It's like, it's like the greatest secret on the planet is to survey your clients and ask your clients what they want I've been spending my life giving clients what they want, not what I've got on my wagon. And we can take a stab at that, and the wagon often is relatively accurate, but I'd love to develop the thing they want, first and foremost. It's it's a fail-safe formula, all right? But it's not how most people go about business. Um, It's called research, yeah. Um, define your ideal client or prospect based on who they are, what they do, and what they buy. Uh, they're the critical things you need to know. Um, marketing starts with finding the right group to talk to. So marketing and sales are one. A lot of people want to separate those two things. They're actually one thing. Two different Parts, but they're one thing. Marketing and sales go together. Uh, Trust me, um, the sales team can undo your marketing effort in a nanosecond. Okay? (laughs) To some extent. Uh, It's imperative to identify your specific primary best prospect. Low-hanging fruit. (coughs) Who will give you money and give it to you now two types of target audience there's primary which we call the the low fruit ready to be picked Uh, and that should be your bread and butter okay and then of course secondary Um, they're not ready yet but they they very well may be you know that slide on uh, three and ten percent ready to buy now Um, focus on your primary group first your bread and butter Okay, and get some money in the bank. And then they pay for the expansion and the scaling of your business, 
not you. It doesn't come out of your pocket. Pick the low-hanging fruit before trying to find the secondary market, preferably, with your product. Um, focus on your primary group until you, have a, until you have a strong system. Okay, We're now building the system simultaneously. Okay. Then and only then go after the secondary group. Uh, if you're not picking your customer, you're missing out on the grandest prize of all. So, to do that, um, you need to know exactly who your ideal avatar is. And one way to do that can be surveys as well. Um, Triple B Blueprint, the two uh, billion dollar number two building block, here it is here, is um, right message. Okay, um, that's congruent with your market. So you have to craft compelling messages to say to your ideal client. Doesn't matter, did want to play. Uh, you have to have a compelling message that arrives in the form of marketing and it's the core of every great marketing message. Now that's what that is. It's a marketing message that are a, a, a message, compelling message that arrives in the form of marketing. Has to be, of course, online and offline. Um, so, uh, rich people ask two questions: Why should they buy, and why should they buy from me? Um, that was work in progress for you, Dave. Um, I think I want to ask you, John, why should we buy from you um, as opposed to each other mortgage broker in the marketplace? Personal service. When do they know it's personal service? From the time they talk to me. Right, so we've got a problem. Have we? Yeah, we have, because I haven't spoken to you yet, and your message doesn't necessarily... I don't know that until I'm actually working with you. Okay. Sorry, I assume that you just called me. Yeah, that's okay. But we had to get the phone to ring. So what's our... What's our well, what's, what's, people are coming via phone now, so it's more about email than through... No, 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 whatever the equivalent of the phone is. Okay. Okay, whatever the equivalent is of the phone. So what's our message? What's our elevator pitch? Um, so your elevator pitch to me is going to be personal service. Is there anything else you'd like to add? So we will guide the person through the process of getting a home loan. Okay. Guys, anyone in the room, put up your hand if you've ever taken out a home loan. Put up your hand if you haven't taken out a home loan. Okay, we're all ideal clients in this room apart from Dom. Um, okay. Based on what John said, who wants to sign up? Put your hand up. Mm. <laughs> You're his mate. You're his mate. I have. It doesn't alter the fact he doesn't have a message that matches the marketplace. Okay, so... Say the challenges. It says, that it, message it says compelling yeah. message. That's There's a distinction. Yeah. Okay, so um, you tell me. Uh, well, no, let me ask you, John. Are you okay with this, buddy? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Okay, mate. Uh, all right, so what is their um, biggest fear and frustration? I'm a, a mortgage person wanting a mortgage. What is my biggest fear and frustration, want and desire and need? So it depends on the buyer. So on, on average, give me the average person. No such thing as an average. If there's a, it depends on the first home buyer or, or a... No, there's going to be a, 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 a the usual client, not average in a sense of them being average, but the, the, the person you help most, okay, what is my biggest... Well, to, you tell me who they are. So ask the question again. Who am I as your ideal client? Am I, how old am I? How much am I borrowing? See, that's where there's no averages. So 
from my perspective, what you're asking doesn't exist is in, in a simple answer. So if you're so once I know whether you're a first home buyer, then you're likely to borrow four hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so if you're a second home buyer, you're likely to borrow six hundred and seven hundred thousand dollars, and so on. Where do you make most of your money? Do you make it in first home buyers, or do you make it in people buying their second home? I, in people looking to invest in their second and third properties. That was hard, <laughs> but we got there, didn't we? Right. Okay. So the money. What do we follow? The money. the money. Okay. So we're following the money now, John. Okay. Now, the oh, just, just to clarify, just explain what you mean by that. Well, you just said your, your, your best client is, is buying an investment property. Yes. Okay, right. So how old am I? 40 to 50. Great. Right. Okay. Uh, married? Generally. Yep. Yeah. Um, Living in a relatively affluent sub, suburb or whatever, or reasonable suburb? Average suburb. Average suburb, okay, all right. Um, have I got one job or two or whatever, or, you know? Yeah, PAYG, generally. Yeah. And um, what is my biggest fear and frustration? That you won't get the loan. That I won't get the loan? Correct. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we got there. <laughs> so. No, 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 I'm asking this guy. I'm not asking you. Um, so, uh, I think you're right. Uh, I think the answer is particularly right now that I won't get the loan. Okay, so what now, what would you say to me? What was your original answer, please, John? Service. Or service. Some, okay, yeah. okay, right, service. Well, do I want service? Or what's my definition of service now that we've got clear? Getting me the loan. Getting me the loan. So what... Oh, sorry. I'm not good at this sort of role play. That's right? okay. Yeah, this is not how I operate, but anyway, let's carry yeah. on. Well, it's, right. the, it's the same one I used on Steel Blue Boots, mate, and made them, we don't know how much money. Yeah. It's exactly the same questions. Okay? I understand, yeah. Right, so if you're not asking it, someone needs to ask it. All right? So this is how you get to the bottom, because there's two questions you ask. Uh, question number one, why should they buy from me? As opposed to each and every other person in my category. If you can't answer that, and most of you can't, the next question is, what's their biggest fears, frustrations, wants and desires and needs? They're being defined as your ideal client, where the money is, which we've got to. Okay, It's an investor. All right, which is great. So you're saying the catchphrase there should be, I can get you that loan. Yeah, well, I'm, so, um, but I'm trying to hear it from John, okay? So... See, see, the diff, there's a different motivation to play. Your, your questioning is going away from where I operate. So this, that's why I'm not responding to it. I don't, I'm not connecting with your line of question. My process is that once... A, somebody, a customer, a prospect comes available to me, then it's just a simple conversation about what are your expectations, what are you trying to achieve, where have you gone so far to, to get to where you want to go, and then we work from that point on. So my role is, I don't do a selling role per se, my role is about, I've got some experience here that I can impart and I can help you with through the journey. Is that the sort of support you want to do this, or do you want to go and suck my brains dry of all the information you need and then walk, wander into the bank with branch on the corner and try and do a deal direct with the bank? That, well, that's basically what it comes down to. Yeah, so scalability comes from the ability to be able to create lead generation systems and conversion systems. So most of what you talked about happens uh, after you meet. So we have to have an attraction system, which is often used uses baits, which is what we're using over here, okay, through our ideal avatar. Ooh, gee. Um, so, um, no, it doesn't, or the equivalent thereof, email, whatever it might be. Um, but the marketing but, there would be that person that was happy with that service that referred him, I got my loan off of this guy. Yeah, but that's a million-dollar referral system, which we've already covered off on, and which you know is available on the site to study and learn. 
But again, it's after the event, because when do they know you're great? After they've done the business, not before. So I can't find anybody with a million dollar referral system. That's the problem. So um, play the game with me, even though you mightn't do it your, we might be doing it your way. Um, so, uh, and then we'll go to a break. Uh, it'll be lunch. My wife's got it already out there for us. So if I can just get some agreement. Uh, the agreement is it's, a, it's, a, it's an investor. And I'm somewhere between 40 and 50 years of age. Um, is, is, your, is a very good client of yours, prospective client. True or true? Um, could be. It might be a new client. Yeah, Sorry? It might be a new client, so it might not be an existing customer. I didn't say an existing client. I said a new, a, an ideal prospect for you was an investor. I didn't say they were as an existing client. Okay. That, right. yeah, yeah, which you said is your... Just your client's an investor, correct. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, and they're between 40 and 50. Yep? Yes. Okay, right. Um, what are my biggest fears, frustrations, want, desires and needs? To which you replied, will I get the loan? Correct. But I always love to ask this question. Um, what am I really selling? And my sarcastic answer is, um, beds, you idiot. Well, I'm not. I'm selling comfort and a great night's sleep and health and a whole bunch of other things. Um, what are you selling, you idiot? Um, I'm selling motorhomes. Well, you're not really selling motorhomes. You're selling the idea of travelling around the country in retirement, you know, meeting new friends and going to new places and seeing the world. Who knows? It's not what you're really selling. So the question is, what are you really selling? I'm selling work boots. Well, no, you're not. You're selling comfort, you know, when, when they're on a, on a building site, uh, on a mining site, doing 12-hour days. It, it's a comfort, is what you're really selling. So the question always is, what are you really selling? Now, I, I'm making this up to some extent, but I'm one of them, so a bit older, <laughs> but I was one of them, that's for sure. Uh, but one of the things is... Um, I'm, se I'm, I'm selling retirement, safe, secure, financial freedom and retirement. True or true? True. Yeah, there you go. So that's what you're really selling, I think, when you're helping an investor get a mortgage to invest in an investment property. Would that be fair to say? Yes. Hmm, Interesting. So you see where we've got to? So now it's um, uh, how to retire early uh, with financial freedom and peace of mind um, could easily be the conversation. Um, guaranteed because it, it, how many home loans uh, do you get across the line of the uh, in 10? Uh, with your service that you talk to us about, that you're good at, your 10 years of what you do. So the question is how many out of 10? Out of 10, just give me a number because it's maths. 10. 10. 100% success rate. Absolutely 100%. So do we want to hear service? You don't need to be here. No. Yeah. No, it's serious. That's yeah. because, because I, but, you position mate, the client, you understand what yeah, the client's needs yeah, are yeah. before you make the application. You don't make an mate, application if it's not going to work. Love your work and believe you. But it's not what you said when we asked you why we should buy from you, when we were able to um, disseminate what it is that really bother me. So, but we got it, and that is that yours is 100%, and you kept it a secret. So um, it's fantastic. But I've never say that to a client before we've got to that stage because it might not happen, and therefore we'd have to go back and say, this is my stuff up, I, didn't, I shouldn't have done that. So uh, we would never get to that guarantee if you like we, generally a client will say to me what's my chance I'll say 99% out of 100 you're gonna, you know we're going to get there I can tell you now it's going to happen but I just need a bit of paper to prove it uh, we'll be able to did, did you, three weeks earlier okay right did you just hear that okay so who would like to sign up with John now just show John 99.9% .9 of the time no, no I, I'll get your loan across the line in spite of the difficulties in the marketplace um 
right now. In 99, we don't need 99. They don't want 99. They want a number. Do you get me? They want a number. It doesn't matter if it's 72%. Because everyone else is lame. Plain vanilla. With no number. Doesn't have to be 99. The fact that you're 99 is brilliant. But we don't even have to leave. I said to Steel Blue Boots, guarantee your boot for the life of the wearer at my very first meeting. What did they go for? 90 days. They didn't need what I said. And, and they're still worth a fortune. Okay, so this is getting to the language, to the message to market match, based on them, not based on you, but not based on your deliverables. Now, John, and any one of you that is John, if I found out what the deliverable was, then I would put that on my wagon. I didn't know that Steel Blue Boots was comfortable or not. That wasn't my job. If it turned out that they weren't, they had to fix the boot. Because what I promised would send them what? Broke. So you match the product to the market. Is everyone starting to... Anyone already understand? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think so. Once John tells you he's going to save you money, I'm signing up. Yeah, we'll save you money and um, get you the loan you need. Yeah. Yeah. So your USP will probably say at very competitive rates. Or well, better language than that, but we get it. All right? So um, I think better, we better take lunch. That's what we better do.